either as bread or as a kind of porridge or gruel. Estimates derive from ancient evidence and studies of the diets of rural Mediterranean peasants at the dawn of the 20th century suggest that as much as 80% of the caloric intake of about 80% of Romans may have come from just these three crops. Recent scholarship has begun to complicate this monotonous picture, proposing that a greater variety of foods was eaten. Even if the percentages creep down a bit, however, these three staples certainly formed a large part of the typical Roman's diet. One characteristic shared by these items that made them attractive to cultivate is that all three could be preserved for a substantial period of time and then eaten later. The grain, olive oil, wine diet would have been supplemented by seasonal fruits and vegetables when they could be obtained. Meat, especially red meat, would have been a rarity. Pork was the most readily available meat product and appears to have been quite popular with the Romans. Where available, fish was also greatly enjoyed. Adding some flavor to this diet was a kind of fish sauce called garum that seems to have been much loved by the Romans. The recipe for making garum was to take many of the undesirable parts of the fish, such as the entrails, heads, and fins, and mix them together with herbs and olive oil. This concoction was then put in a barrel or pot and placed in the hot sun, where it was allowed to ferment. The resultant smelly paste was strained and served hot over bread or added to other foods. There was even the Roman equivalent of fast food restaurants, where pedestrians could come up to a counter and purchase a bowl of garum and some bread. While the culinary lives of most Romans were monotonous, it was a different story for rich, upper-class Romans. Their wealth enabled them to eat a vast array of exotic comestibles and to hold lavish banquets. Breakfast and lunch were usually light meals, while dinner was the principal meal of the day and sometimes the occasion for very extravagant meals. At a formal Roman dinner party, the guests arrived, removed their shoes, and were led to a dining room called a triclinium. Romans lay down on couches when they ate, leaning on their left elbows. Around three sides of a square table were placed low benches or beds called triclinia. Each of these held three diners so that a full dinner party consisted of nine people. If there were more guests, then the host had to set up another set of triclinia. Romans used knives and spoons, but not forks. The first course of appetizers was little treats, such as olives, snails, vegetables, eggs, or shellfish. Main courses were elaborate meat dishes. Boar and sow's udders were very popular. A particular delicacy was eels and lampreys. Uh, many Roman aristocrats owned heated fish ponds in which eels were raised, and they competed with one another to see who could grow the biggest and tastiest ones. Dessert consisted of nuts and fruit such as apples, pears, and figs. There might be entertainment at the meal, such as music, jugglers, magicians, actors, or a literary reading of poetry or history. After dinner was eaten, there would be drinking and conversation. The host would determine the ratio of wine to water that would be served, and would often select a specific topic of conversation. There were actually guidebooks for hosts listing suggested topics, ranging from heavy philosophical ones such as, what are the characteristics of the noble man, 
to lighter subjects, including why is fresh water better than salt for washing clothes? Is wrestling the oldest sport? And what came first, the chicken or the egg? Finally, the guests would depart, but first they might wrap up uneaten food in their napkins to take home as a snack for later. Some Romans were famous for their gluttony, and there are many well-known instances of ostentatious banquets. The best source for elaborate Roman recipes is a cookbook written by a famous glutton named Apicius. He is said to have spent 100 million sesterces on food, and when he realized that he had only a few million left, he decided that because he could no longer dine properly in his eyes, he committed suicide. He left behind a book of recipes, which range from familiar dishes such as omelets and sweet and sour pork, to more exotic ones, using ostrich brains, flamingo tongues, sheep's lungs, and pig's wombs. Roman gourmands paid enormous sums for the perfect fish, such as the 8,000 sesterces that were spent for a single mullet. And periodically, the Roman state actually passed laws making it illegal to spend more than a certain amount on one meal, or to make overly elaborate dishes. The Romans, like the Greeks, usually diluted their wine with water before drinking it. Romans also enjoyed some wines that were served warm, and these often had spices added to them. A popular hot wine was mulsum, which was sweetened with honey. Fine wines were allowed to age before being drunk and the Romans recognized that some vintages were superior to others. Imported wines from Greece, such as Chian or Lesbian, were regarded highly. Among Italian wines, Falernian was particularly prized as being considerably more expensive than run-of-the-mill vintages. Now that we've seen how Romans ate, let's look at where they lived. When it comes to housing, the experiences of Romans varied greatly according to economic status. The inhabitants of the countryside lived in houses made of stone or mud brick, often with several generations of the family sharing rooms with farm animals. Rich people in the city lived in a private house, the word for which was domus, from which comes our word domestic. The wealthy also often owned sumptuous country villas. The majority of people living in Rome, however, rented apartments. A document known as the Regionary Catalogues lists all the different buildings in ancient Rome in the 4th century AD. And at that time, there were only 1,797 buildings that were identified as a domus, a private home. But there were a whopping 46,602 apartment buildings. This discrepancy is even more shocking if you consider that each domus only contained one family, but an apartment building could shelter hundreds. Roman houses in the city had few or no windows, and from the outside, a house would have resembled a blank wall. The center of the house and its focal point was the atrium, this was usually a courtyard with a large opening in the ceiling to admit light. Adjacent to the atrium was a raised platform where the potter familius would sit when receiving visitors of lower status. The dining room or triclinium also usually opened onto the atrium. In the back of the house were a series of tiny rooms which functioned as the bedrooms. Each of these was called a cubiculum, the root of our word cubicle. The quarters for slaves and women were also at the rear of the house. Some Roman houses included a walled enclosure at the back that served as a garden. Roman houses were more or less the same range of sizes as modern houses, with the average Roman house being around 2,000 square feet. The most 
obvious and famous feature of these houses was the lavish decoration of the walls and floors. Much of the expense and effort that in a modern home might be spent on furniture and decorative objects, the Romans directed towards ornamenting the structure itself. In many rooms, all four walls were plastered over and then completely covered in elaborate wall paintings, while the floors were coated with intricate mosaics. To a modern viewer, the palette of colors employed in Roman wall painting might well appear strange, dominated as it was by large expanses of black, gold, and a very distinctive deep blood red shade. Another focal point of ornamentation was the floors, which were covered with mosaics formed by taking very small cut pieces of colored stones and pressing them into wet mortar to form images, ranging in complexity from simple black and white geometric patterns to truly astonishingly detailed color pictures. The subject matter of these mosaics was extremely diverse, with some of the most elaborate examples depicting historical scenes, mythological stories, uh, wild beasts both exotic and mundane, and realistically rendered sea life. By current standards, Roman houses would have appeared surprisingly empty. Much of the basic furniture was made of wood or bronze. Romans could choose from an assortment of chairs, stools, and sofas with varying numbers of legs. 